Welcome. I'm so excited that you're here to join us for Cruise Combos. So what is Cruise Combos? Cruise Combos is going to be a series of conversations, but very important, it's going to be casual conversations with cruise industry leaders across the globe. As the founder of Lemonade, I want to welcome you to this experience. I really hope you enjoy and also have a little bit of fun. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, you're the zest. I'm so excited to have three amazing people here. Giannis from Greece, Brian and David. I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourself. I'm going to start with Giannis. Tell us who you are, where you're from, share a little bit about yourself. Thank you, thank you, Claudine. It's uh, so nice to be here with you and uh, two uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, I'm Yanis Bras. Uh, I'm CEO of 560 Consulting. I'm coming from Greece. Uh, uh, it's a place that everybody loves. I love it too. Uh, I come from the island of Crete, actually. Um, I have a boutique consultancy uh, that specializes in cruise development. And for the past few months, I've been working really hard with a cruise restart. Um, I, I've specialized now and I'm helping uh, ports around the world uh, with the proced proced procedures, processes and uh, measures. Uh, I know it can be sometimes can be boring, but this is cutting edge and we need to get moving and you know, get people back in the ships and start cruising again. So that's the mo most important thing. Thank you, Claudine. Epic. Epic. I love it. David, tell us who you are. Hi. Claudine, Giannis, Brian, uh, great to see everyone uh, here today. So I'm David Canib. Uh, I work for Carnival Corporation now coming on 19 years and all in the same uh, realm, which has been uh, port and destination development. So I've really had uh, an incredible journey the last kind of 19 years, and it's really in support of all of our nine global brands and, and helping them develop new destinations, working with uh, our partners in existing destinations, creating new infrastructure, creating new attractions, uh, and then working obviously within the industry. And, and we've done some projects jointly with other companies. So basically we're enabling our brands to create great new itineraries or enhance existing itineraries. So it's been an incredible ride. I was born and raised in Miami, left for a while to Atlanta and New York, but uh, the sun uh, was calling me back. So after graduate school, I started uh, and and from there, it's just been running with Carnival. It's been, been a great journey so far. Love it. Thanks for sharing. Brian, you're next. Well, thank you. Thank you, fellow Canadian. Um, my name is Brian Atri, manager of worldwide port operations for Royal Caribbean Group, uh, which is Azamara, Celebrity Cruises, and Royal Caribbean International. Uh, I've been with cruising since about 2002 when I stepped foot on my first ship. So I uh, was shipboard for almost 10 years. I uh, had a hiatus from university, went back to university, went back to ships. Uh, I was supposed to be a history teacher, but for some reason I said, I'll do one more contract. The famous line, I'll do one more contract. And uh, 10 years later, <laughs> I came out the other side and was able to go back to Canada with my newly found wife from ships from America and worked in travel and tourism in Canada and then was presented an opportunity to go shoreside with the Holland America Group in Fort Lauderdale. And then during my time with Holland America Group, uh, Royal Caribbean came calling and I couldn't say no and, and very happy to be with uh, Royal Caribbean Group now and Port Operations. Uh, my main region is North America and the Caribbean, and I do support our other uh, folks around the world uh, when there's a crisis, and we are all living that right now. Um, but being in Florida is fantastic. Like David said, the sun was calling. I'm not much of a snow fan. And when my wife said, can we go to Florida? She packed her bags, ditched the snow boots, minus 35, and, and came over and, and was uh, quite happy to be down here. Love it. I think... Did I, lose? I think we lost you there for a second. This is great because it's edited, right? Maybe I should just leave this part in. <laughs> it's real time. There it's real go. time, right? It's what everyone's experiencing every day. It's facts of life nowadays. Did you see the, the quote? We'll wait for Brian. Did you see the quote that said, uh, the quote of the year for 2020? You're on mute. 
that's a good one. I don't know how many times I've said that to and, people. Uh, <laughs> You're back. <laughs> where where did you lose me? I, I, I thought everybody was petrified of what I was saying because none of your faces were changing. <laughs> then, I, then I realized I lost the connection. I think you ended good. I think we got you. I was like, yeah, great. And and then it just... Where did, where did I end? You ended right when you said uh, your wife packed up the bags, you went to Miami, and then it's been good. <laughs> and then just kind of stopped. You're good. Well, that's that's, you know, if we're still recording, that's great because that just shows exactly what it's like to work from home during COVID and the suspension of service and the challenges that you, you go through working from home. And I think that was one of the questions with what has been the difficult aspect of working from home and suspension of service. And it's exactly that. Your internet connections can die instantly. And oh, yeah, everything. for sure. All right, we'll keep going. That was awesome. We should just leave it in. No, I'm just leave it. I, I, I personally believe we leave it in because anybody that's going to be watching this will sympathize with exactly what happened. You're right. I love it. All right, David, go on to you. Share with us your most epic memory as a kid, vacation, going as a family, doing some type of family trip when you were young. Like, Share with us your most epic memory. Well, I would say I'm, you know, really blessed that I grew up in Miami Beach and actually cruising was a huge part of our vacation experience. So we would go cruising during spring break. We would go during the summer. So I really remember, you know, these amazing attractions, actually walking and, and uh, taking part in Duns River Fall and doing some Stingray City in Grand Cayman and then coming together as a family for dinner and then doing our things and meeting friends, new friends. And, and so actually it's, it's fascinating that, you know, come full circle, I was able to be part of this, you know, amazing industry. So we took a lot of cruises on a lot of great ships. Uh, one of my favorites actually was uh, the Norway. You know, it was a, a classic, incredible ship. Uh, always seeing that growing up, you know, on the causeway in Port of Miami. So I've been around the industry and, and cruising has been a big part actually of our, our family growing up. Love it. You can tell, you know, you love the cruise industry. It's beautiful. Giannis, share with us. Uh, this is actually a story not many people know, but uh, in 1979, uh, I had to travel from Crete to Santorini. Uh, my father was working there as a head of tax office. So he, there was no, no direct communication at the time, so, but there was a cruise ship. And there was a cruise ship going from Miracle to Sandorini. So my father made arrangements, being the head of tax you know, in, the, in the island, for us to, to, to board and be able to swim back the next day in Sandorini. I was there seven years old, I remember that. At that time, the slot machines were just in a room in the ship with, you know, there were no rules about kids or anything at that time. So my, I remember my grandma uh, gave me a good size pocket money, 200 drachma at the time, which is maybe now it's less than, than, less than a dollar. So uh, I go in, I go around the ship, right? And I, I spotted the slot machines and they were taking something around five cents, five cents at, at, the, at the draw. So there I am, I escaped my mother from the room. My mother is looking for me. And I was there on the slot machines, playing on the slot machines. And I, after two hours, I go back in the cabin, a small kid with my T-shirt turned like this with all the five cents in, in the, in the, in the T-shirt. My mother, you know, sees all this and says, oh my God, what's happening? You know, you know, it's, this, is, this is not right. So he calls in the captain and the captain, uh, you know, comes. Uh, he, he knew that we were special guests and he said to her, look, he won them fair and square. So it's his money. Uh, the, 2000, the 200 drachmas became 2,000 drachmas, which was a lot for the time being. So uh, after arriving in Sandorini, and I will cut the story short, after about a week, believe it or not, I must have done the first leasing of a donkey in history. Because I rented a donkey for the, my duration, I was going to be in the island for three months, and I had a donkey on my doorstep every day with my 2000 drachma. That's my favorite childhood memory. Giannis, gambling from a young age, I see. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a great story. That's a great story. Brian, what do you have to share? Well, how do I follow up on that? I, I, I hope my internet cuts out again. I can't beat a, a gambling 
and leasing of a donkey story, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, we, just like David, is our family uh, grew up cruising and, and put the bug in my head very young at age eight to say, wouldn't you like to work on the ships when you're older? And then you fast forward many years later, I, I did get on the ships. But one of our, our trips, because I'm from British Columbia, it was easy to drive from where we are to Vancouver and, and embark and go up to Alaska. So we did one trip as a family um, and I actually got to stay in a cabin with my grandfather. And this is part of the fun story is that he was so worried about me as, as an 11 year old staying in the cabin with him that I was gonna steal his dentures. He locked his dentures in the safe every night thinking that I was going to sneak into the bathroom and steal them. So for seven nights, his dentures lived in the safe. But one, one night I didn't go back to the cabin and as you were back, you know, back when cruising was smaller ships, we were on the old Pacific Princess, kids were able to roam free on board and and get little packs of kids and there was really wasn't a youth program there would be one person that would put a deck of cards in a in a card room and say kids meet here and play cards so you get these little groups of friends for seven days and um i skipped curfew um my curfew was about 11 o'clock at night that was great for an 11 year old so when my grandfather called my parents cabin and said he's not here my dad went out searching the ship for me and as he's walking around the ship searching for me, it was that one when he was going this way, I was going that way, constantly avoiding him and not knowing he was looking for me. He ended up on the outside deck and there was someone my size sleeping in a, in a, in a lounger, thinking it was me with a towel over their head and I don't know why they were there. So he came walking up, angry as a father could be, screaming, Brian, William, Matry, where are you? Why are you sleeping on the deck? And ripped the towel off the person and gave this poor guy a heart attack. And it wasn't me. <laughs> so they, they ended up yelling at each other. Why are you waking me up? Where's my son and all this? And then I ended up coming around the corner and walking into that little bit of a mess. And uh, for the rest of the cruise, my curfew was was dumped down to about 9 p.m. So I, I lost that opportunity. So for me, that was great memories as a kid cruising and, and my parents putting the bug in my head. And I think for the 10 years I worked on board, anytime I walked by someone in a lounger with a towel over them, I had this urge to grab the towel and scream at them, Brian William Atry, where are you? That is awesome. <laughs> Excellent story. That is awesome. What about the dentures, though? No, I'm just joking. Your grandpa. Well, I, I said to him, I said to him, what, he's an, he was an ex uh, RCMP officer. Uh, so he didn't really mess around a lot. I, I, as a young kid, I realized where all the pressure points were in my, my neck and my hands. You know, he would <laughs> experiment on me. I, I had said to him, I'm going to steal your dead in the cruise. From there. Awesome. <laughs> all right, let's jump into some questions. All right, so what has been the most difficult thing that you have learned or what has been the most difficult challenge during this whole time? And we'll throw that out to David. Well, I would say um, the most difficult is by nature, our industry is incredibly social. And uh, I've really enjoyed my time in the industry because we get together so often, whether it's through travel or conferences or just within the office and, you know, partners that are coming in and vendors and, and Shorex or, or port and government. So I think the hardest thing is um, quickly adapting to, you know, a virtual world. Um, I've been incredibly impressed, though, with the capability of us as an industry and really as a world to move into, you know, a virtual norm and mindset um, through Zoom and WebEx, you know, and Teams. So it's incredible from that basis. I think the, the hardest part, though, is still I have colleagues, you know, within uh, my own team that I haven't seen in maybe coming on a year. We're probably talking more than we ever were before you know, through a virtual or through phone or through email, but I certainly miss that personable connection. And sometimes even when you have virtual or through an email, I think when you can sit down and meet with somebody and go over something, you can, you know, work through something in probably 15, 20 minutes. And in this means of realm that we're on, it can take, you know, another day or two. So I miss, you know, being with uh, our, our own team at work and being within our partners in the industry because it's such a happy and great industry. And it's hard to shift to really, 
you're independent. I mean, we see everyone like we do today, but you're not really interacting as we normally are accustomed to. So for me, that's been been a challenge and trying to find outlets other way and, and keeping those uh, relationships as, as strong as possible. Great answer. Thank you, David. Giannis, Brian, Giannis, you go next. Do you want to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think now in 2019, I might have, have done about 50, 54, 55 trips, you know, to various clients uh, for holidays or something. And in 2020, I did two. Uh, and I did two with double mask uh, and a shield and, and the whole lot. So, uh, you know, connecting face-to-face uh, -to, -face to me is also always important. And, you know, when you are working with a destination, you need to be able to go there and taste for yourself, the, you know, what's, what's the characteristics that you're going to uh, develop and then suggest the cruise lines to use and, and make, you know, enhancements. And this is proven to be very difficult to do from a distance. Um, you know, if you don't go and see this nice winery or you don't go and see this, this forest of uh, ancient olive trees or this nice beach, how can you, how can you promote it? How can you, uh, you know, go back to, to you guys and say, look, this, this is something your excursions team should include. I mean, uh, so uh, in my line of work, uh, you know, Claudine, I've been developing something called the cruise, the destination cruise excursion book. Uh, which is something I do to assist cruise lines and showcase some suggestions from the destination to the cruise lines, right? So they can increase experience. And uh, in my last contracts, I was unable to fulfill this thing and it's still on hold till I'm, I'm able to go back and, you know, see for myself and be able to complete this. Um, so that's, that was the hardest thing that last year, actually. Thank you for sharing. Brian. Yeah, I, I, I can't disagree with anything uh, with anything they've said up to this point. It's, it's been such a challenge virtually and, and not being able to, to see and hear and smell um, everything that we, we have in the industry. And from my side, when I think of what's been the most difficult aspect of the, the suspension of sailing is we didn't have a playbook for this. No one had a, a guideline of how do you respond to this global crisis. We've been through, as an industry, through many challenges. We've been through 9-11. We've been through swine flu, avian bird flu, SARS. We've had hurricanes. We've had fires. We, we've, we've paused a singular cruise at time. Or we put ships into dry dock where guests will go off. But we always have the goalposts there, knowing when we're going to have guests coming back on board. And during this time, when we went out in March, ignorantly, I, you know, we were thinking four weeks, maybe six weeks, maybe eight weeks. No one had any clue that this was going to go as far as it has up to now without guests on board. And as we are working, and I'm saying when we didn't have a playbook, we're talking every cruise line, every ship, every agency we worked with, every partner we work with, no one had a guidebook to say, let us step in and be the leader, and this is what you do. It was trial and error for everybody. And what I've been most impressed with is the cruise lines have come together. You know, we haven't, you know, as Dave was saying, we're, we're a very social community in industry. We talk, we meet, but the sharing of information has, has never been better. The calling your colleague in, a, in the same department, another cruise line, and saying, what are you doing in Manila? What are you doing in the Caribbean? Sharing of information. How, you know, how do you lay up a ship? No one has ever discussed doing cold, cool, warm, hot layups. Um, that was an astronomical move to start putting ships around the world and, and not conflict with other brands or sharing knowledge and understanding of you will find roadblocks here in this border, potholes here, or barriers there from a certain government. Um, we were writing this playbook as we go along and we'd have to rip out pages, go back to page one, rip it out, rewrite it again. You, you speak with the Coast Guard, you know, customs, you speak with the CDC and everybody is just reacting. And I am so impressed with the industry on how we reacted as an industry to get our ships safe, get our crew home. I could go on hours about the crew repatriation efforts that, that we did. Um, you know, bringing the ships down to minimal manning, making them safe, putting ships into cold layup, sell, you know, some companies are selling ships, some ships are 
are moving brands. It, it's just been, it's been a phenomenal and very sad time. In and you've seen a lot of our colleagues, unfortunately, having to be furloughed or laid off because of the suspension of cruising. But I think we're on the other side of the mountain now. I think we've written the playbook. I think it's there. I think we've learned valuable lessons uh, and we are, we're getting closer. And I think there will be a collective um, cheers amongst the industry when that first gets, guest comes back on a vessel. And I'll just say singularly in, in North America, because that's where we're focused right now, but we know we have guests in Europe. We have guests in, in Asia now. When those guests first came on, there was a celebration. It didn't matter what cruise line had the first guest on, everybody celebrated that one vessel when they had that first guest come back. So for me, it's been um, very, very difficult, but satisfying at the same time and sad at the same time. That's a great answer. Thank you, Brian. Let's talk about port development. David, what's the future looking like? Let's talk 2022, 2023. What do you want to share with us? So I think for us, we're, you know, we're very eager to get all of our, you know, remaining ships in operation this year. Um, and, and really the, the capability that myself and, and my team and our group is we have a long-term vision and certainly the, the cruising future is very bright. As you can see from all of um, the information that you see from the cruise lines that are out there and, and providing public information on the bookings, you know, going out a year and two, there is pent up demand and, and demand for cruising. So that translates into continued development of destinations and creating new and exciting itineraries. So we're keenly focused on that um, and continue to look at infrastructure projects and existing destinations because we as a company and and you see this as an industry, the ships are getting larger. And as that comes in and moves around and shifts in different regions of the world, uh, there may be opportunities for us to collaborate with partner destinations uh, and do some things, not only within the port area or some exciting experiences surrounding that. So we're, we're focused on that. I think the challenge for us uh, in this new era will be, we have to be focused a little bit more um, because we as a company have certainly taken on some additional liquidity to help us work through and, and navigate the challenges of, of uh, no operations and, and no revenue really coming in except small cruises in, in Europe. So while we'd like to do all the port development that we can and all these great projects that are out there, probably the next few years will be a little bit different uh, in the scale of that because we'll have to come back, get ourselves operationally and on solid footing, you know, pay down some of this debt and, and generate the cash flow. We're a publicly traded company. So we have to target, you know, shareholder return as well. Um, but I think the, the future is still there. Everyone continues to build new ships and those are coming online down the road and people still want to cruise. So we are very excited to continue to talk with all of our partner destinations and exploring opportunities that are there for us to do that. Thank you, thank you, love it. Brian, do you wanna share a little bit more of what you're doing right now to prepare to get all the ships back with people on them? Well, it is, it's a step-by-step -step process to come back and, and, and the key to all of the return to sale and it's the healthy return to sale um, aspect of it is, is communication with our external partners, uh, the CDC, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Customs, um, having a dialogue with, with our port partners and, and, and the destinations that we wish to sail to. So it starts with communication and understanding of the capabilities of our partners and our destinations to be able to receive the ships in a, in a healthy, um, in a healthy return to sail aspect of it. So we we take guidance from the CDC on how we are going to be returning um, to to cruise. Uh, there are several phases that we we must accomplish before we get back to our revenue sailings, and and we are on track with that. And and it starts with. Um, our crew. Uh, we need to make sure our crew are healthy, that they are COVID free, and it's the, the slow movement of bringing crew back to the ships, 
bringing the ships back into service. You know, they, they have been out of service for coming up to a year in March. Um, maintenance needs to be done. You know, certain systems on board have been shut down and then been uh, covered up. So if you just take a casino, for example, everything has been bagged and covered up and turned off and powered down. You think about all the equipment in the theater has been powered down and, 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 and stored. So that all needs to come back. The ships need to be deep cleaned. We're not saying they're dirty, but again, if you have a cabin sitting, sitting empty for 11 months, you need to go in and refresh that cabin. So it's bringing the ships back in a healthy return to sale aspect. And then from there, it's working with our home ports, first of all, to make sure that you obviously can have a home port to do the turnarounds. How do those turnarounds look? How do you bring guests on into a healthy and safe environment? How do you then sail out and go to a destination? And what David was talking about with our destinations, where we look at it from Royal Caribbean, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Carnival is the same way, our private destinations, our private destinations that we've developed will be the jewel in the crown for the return to sale, at least in North America and the Caribbean, because that's where we will be able to test our protocols and have a so-called bubble experience. We, we don't want to necessarily call it a bubble, but a controlled environment that we can go to with short, sa short sailings and initiate um, a cadence that we are understanding of where our protocols are at. Again, I go back to my previous comment, there isn't a playbook for this. So we need to be cautious, careful, um, and excited to return to sailing, but not rushing into it um, headfirst without identifying um, any challenges or issues. So when we look at Perfect Day at Coco Cay, uh, we're, we're ready to go with the island. The island will be perfect for the short sailings. Um, it will give everybody confidence uh, that these will be healthy um, cruises and they will return back to Miami, Port Everglades, Port Canaveral, and we will then get back into the cadence of, of turnarounds. And again, we can go hours on how we're going to return to sail. I, I always draw back to is communication is key with all of our, our partners, our vendors, our ports, our colleagues and other cruise lines um, and learn, learn the lessons and, and make sure that we, we don't miss that. Very detailed, Brian. I love it. <laughs> we only have another 30 minutes, so I, I stop myself. <laughs> well, you're doing great. <laughs> Giannis, share a little bit about the cruise restart. That uh, What was it here? I have it here. EU Healthy Gateways and the new protocols. You have been working with them. You want to share a little bit about some of the protocols, what the ports? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. I mean, I've been... Um, actually uh, doing a lot of work uh, over the summer months uh, and uh, I was lucky to be involved with uh, representing the, the Ministry of Tourism in Greece on developing the protocols uh, deriving from EU Healthy Gateways. Uh, that's back in uh, July and August uh, that allowed uh, a partial restart in Greece. I mean um, uh, we did have about 50 calls uh, in total you know smaller and larger uh, around there in Greece, uh, successfully, I might add. Uh, unfortunately, the second wave, uh, you know, halted everything again. But uh, also, uh, uh, apparently, I did such, such a good work. So, EU Health Gateways came in and commissioned me to develop what uh, soon is going to be known the port cruise restart process maps. So, uh, Brian, there will be a playbook uh, for ports on how they need really to start, what are the protocols, what are the steps, uh, what is the five pillar communication plan they need to, to, to follow, how to write uh, emergency plan for COVID, um, and uh, you know, how, they, they, how they will need to tackle every situation upon deciding, first of all, the uh, capacity of the port, uh, you know, and making a decision on to, if it's gonna be uh, a home port, uh, or a port of call or a transit port, as we call it here in Europe, or a contingency port, and then uh, they write up uh, plans, uh, you know, for every case, in order not only what's happening in the port or in the ship, but also what happens in land, with COVID hotels, obviously, to be uh, there, you know, transportations. But, uh, you know, I, I can tell you that situation is looking up. Uh, I'm optimistic that uh, we will have... Um, uh, a spring uh, strong start. I know that a few uh, cruise lines have already, uh, you know, both of you actually have already planned some 
uh, cruises, test cruises uh, somewhere in March or April uh, with one ship just to you know, test the waters. And I know that, uh, and we all know that vaccinations have started worldwide, even though there are some delays. Um, well done to the Israelians, by the way. You know, they are the ones who, uh, I was talking today that uh, by March or, you know, end of April, they will be uh, done. Everybody will be vaccinated in Israel. So that's, that's excellent news for them. Um, but uh, at least now, uh, you know, uh, and this new guideline uh, will come out from EU Cathy Gateways in, in eight days from, from today, uh, hopefully. And it will be a good, um, a more detailed guide from the, for the ports. Don't forget that even CDC has given uh, very good directions for cruise lines, but I think that they will need to step up on giving uh, better directions to the, to the ports um, and also how they need to communicate with the cruise lines and make it happen. Uh, I always say that the sooner everybody's involved, the sooner everybody's uh, have formed their cruise restart task force or task team, uh, the better. Uh, and uh, I think the industry needs to work together uh, on providing the necessary tools for that. And this is what the Youth Health Gateways will do. And lastly, um, I think that um, uh, we need to uh, have an, a pre-start assessment uh, in ports uh, so that uh, we can guarantee or check that interoperability is there between the ship's emergency plan and the port's emergency plan. So uh, if you know, we have an emergency, everybody will know what they do and also be very important the communication plans between not only the cruise line the health authorities but also in the ports in the itinerary so everybody knows the information straight away and this will solve uh, or avoid many problems are you done no i'm just yes. joking i'm just I joking that's horrible Okay. Uh, I, I can talk for hours in the matter, but yeah, wouldn't yeah. keep the, the no. The that's great. Short, I, I think I like I like what you were saying near the end. I liked what you were saying at the beginning as well. But near the end, when you were talking about the, the communication between the cruise lines and the health authorities and the ports, and I know at least in, in the regions that I'm working in, we have very open communication and developing these plans. And I think that the main word has I've used a lot is flexibility that everybody has created plans and they're very flexible to go back and make amendments because we are learning every day as we go along what can and cannot work. And it's, it's amazing to see the flexibility with um, the port authorities and the health authorities in certain regions that they're keeping their eyes and ears open and the dialogue is, is there to get to the point to say, this is the date that we are returning so we can finalize everything. Great. The word I use, uh, Brian, is dynamic. Uh, the situation is dynamic. Uh, it's a Greek word, by the way. And uh, we need to, you know, constantly remind ourselves that, you know, it's an evolving situation. But, uh, you know, if we commit, all of us, that uh, we take a step at a time uh, and uh, commit that uh, we will be working towards a start, that's is what's going to happen. Uh, and I urge uh, through uh, this uh, webinar, this, 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 this discussion, all the ports around the world to start doing work. Uh, no matter you know, what's happening at the moment, if you, you know, your, your cruise might start a few months later, all this takes time. And you'll be surprised how long it takes sometimes to, to do agree on where you, uh, where you buy the masks, where you store the masks, who distributes the masks, where do you dispose the masks? You know, sometimes, you know, it might seem easy, but even just the simple thing, masks, right, or personal protection equipment, uh, it's a process by itself. It's a protocol by itself. Or, you know, you need to address this situation of separators or, uh, as I so said before, capacities. What happens if you have two, two ships in the port the same day? You know, for now, they cannot mix and match the passengers. So you must uh, ensure uh, via plan that, you know, uh, each ship will be treated as, as separate and you have uh, uh, formed the technical means to avoid each other, you know, because if you have mix and match and you have one case positive from one ship and then they mix with other ship, then that can spread. Um, and I know that uh, also testing is progressing and, uh, you know, as we go on, uh, rapid tests are more acceptable and more acceptable. And I also uh, think that uh, there should be a common policy regarding which tests are accepted. You know, everybody accepts PCR, of course, 
very, very good, but PCRs take time, we know that. So we need to make sure that, you know, obviously, I think that the large organizations as CLIA or somebody else should need to step in and make a, you know, a common ground, what is acceptable. And this, again, can be dynamic. You know, every month you should have new uh, information as you go on. And this is how we need, we need to go forward. Um, I mean, I don't know which company, I think it was Royal Caribbean, who in the first two weeks, they had about 200,000 volunteers to, to start cruising, you know, the tests, which is excellent. You know, people want to travel. You're right, people do want to travel. Thank you, guys. You guys are doing great. David, give us your top three tips. Let's say a destination has never had any kind of port development or development in their destination, and they really want to, you know, in the future, let's say, work with, with your company. And what would you recommend? What are the top three tips to say to a destination if they want to develop, if they want to start that relationship? Well, I know. Great question. I would say the first is it's an open door. So we're, we always welcome uh, hearing about opportunities um, within destinations. Uh, just because we're always as, as colleagues in the industry traveling here, we're not always aware uh, of things that may be uh, capable to be brought to market. So first is always making sure that we as an industry and, and a company are aware of uh, potential developments and you know kind of in in a few steps the first really is to make sure that nautically it can work and if you're talking about developing a pier alongside uh, that's certainly the market for a pier opens up that for for the ships or let's say the norm for ships from three thousand five and six thousand passengers so are you talking about welcoming those because destinations um, that are just transit and you have tender operations you know it's a little bit more of a narrow kind of uh, market or you know that we can look at so is it capable to bring a ship alongside uh, and is it safe to do so what are you talking about in terms of um, you know the environmental considerations and and uh, seasonality and things like that and then you know once you can progress from saying this could work from a nautical perspective we believe the ship can come in safely uh, and work within the environs of, of the the community and and obviously the the beauty surrounding uh, the sea in the area there then saying okay when we bring guests what is there going to be due for them, you know, and exploring this destination. So as you're aware, you know, people take cruises because they enjoy visiting destinations while the ships in themselves today are incredibly different than they were five or 10 years ago. There's so much to do and explore. People really enjoy coming on board, you know, unpacking once and exploring two, three or four different destinations, you know, depending on what cruise you're on. And so kind of the target mindset is saying, as the ship comes alongside, what are these guests going to be able to do and explore in your destination, whether it's a city, you know, um, or a community, we are kind of narrow from a, a time perspective. So generally it's, you know, an eight hour window. So you've got to be able to say, what can they do, whether, you know, they want to explore three, four hours, you know, on their own in an area, take an organized tour, uh, rent a car or take a taxi. So you have to be able to have, um, you know, the capability for the guests to do tours. They love exploring destinations, whether that's from a culinary perspective, from a shopping perspective, from soft adventures is, is a huge market today, uh, cultural and, and historical. So all these elements play into it and in saying the ship can come in, what can they do now for eight hours? Are there opportunities for the shore excursion teams? Are there opportunities for those guests, you know, who aren't going to take a tour in that, that destination? What can they do? And then obviously still important is the crew because the crew are on board ships, you know, for, for six months or months at a time. And they visit these destinations, you know, maybe every week or bi-weekly. And it's very important to make sure that they, they're comfortable and, and they really enjoy that destination because our guests are so interactive with the crew on board. They're always asking them saying, you know, tomorrow I'm going to destination A. Have you been there? What's great to do? So if they really enjoy 
and have explored that destination and feel great about it, the guests are going to see that when they're interacting with them, whether it's at dinner or in, in the kids club, wherever that may be on board, um, people are always curious about visiting new destinations and hearing about that from people who have already been there. So I think within the industry, I would say, you know, we're always open to, to listening to ports and, and private partners or government in terms of what it is they want to expand or, or grow in their destination. We have a lot of uh, experience in helping develop that ourselves and all the cruise lines really do. So I think we provide that. And in the end, we, any advice that we give, you know, as an industry or as a company, it's going to be because we're the end user. So I think uh, always listening to us and sharing that information is, is a great way to collaborate. And that's what we've done in the past. And I don't see any change of why, why that would differ in the future. Great answer and great tips. Any destinations out there looking? Call David. No. Okay, Brian, I'm going to ask you, give us three top, your top three tips for any of the ports out there. What can they be doing right now? Top three tips. Out there right now, what they can be doing. Uh, we've touched on this um, previously in, in other questions. Uh, they need to start creating a plan. If they, they have, if they haven't created a plan yet, they need to start now. And the plan is how to receive ships properly and in a safe manner. Um, the ports that we're going to be going to in the beginning in the first six months are going to be well-established ports that already have, have the volume for shore excursions and the ability to handle large vessels. So we have to bring it forefront to the conversation of how are they going to receive our guests? How are they going to receive our vessels in, uh, what kind of conversations do they need to have internally as a destination on, let's say phase one, phase two, phase three, because I think when we first go to a port, three months later, the experience is going to be different. We're gonna be rolling out how we arrive into a port and what we're gonna be able to do in a port. And, and you know, there, there are some destinations right now that are way ahead of the game, that they've mobilized their port authority, their, um, their health authority, they've mobilized their tourism and they've come together as a group, a collective group to create large plans on how to receive cruise ships. And part of these plans are already in play for receiving tourists via airplane. So the two dovetail, they're in a partnership together. How you receive a guest via, via a plane will be much different on how you receive a guest via a cruise ship. So they're intertwined, but they're also separate. So if the destinations are, are not having those internal dialogue, that internal dialogue right now, they need to start now because once we get to the point that we are ready for revenue sailing, it is going to be a sprint. Right now, we're a, we're a long distance marathon right now. We are, we are moving along at a set pace, creating plans, getting there, knowing what we need to do. But when that gun goes off, it is going to be a sprint and we will as an industry be rushing back. And if you're not ready, um, we can't bring the vessels to a destination where we feel unsafe or it will be an unsafe experience for our guests. So I'm not gonna give you three, I'm gonna give you one long point number one, and it's been said before, start the dialogue now. And once you have that internal dialogue and you have a, a, a plan in place or a draft of a plan, that's when the cruise lines and the destinations can start talking. Great answer. Love it. Giannis, do you want to share something with us? Maybe something uh, five senses? Or... Yeah, yeah. Let, uh, before I go into that, let me say that there's about 34 different protocols, smaller or larger, that uh, a port should uh, examine. Not everything's for everybody, obviously. If you don't use outdoor space, you don't use outdoor space. But uh, I urge everybody to look out for the results from the usual gateways. Uh, there's a very good process maps with uh, an explanation guide. I'm very proud of this work. Uh, and, uh, you know, this should be able to kickstart kick you, you know, in all your processes. I mean, going back to, to Five Sense, I mean, I've been blessed. Uh, at the moment, I'm working with ports around the world to help them with their start uh, processes. And I can tell you that, uh, again, some ports are more active than others. But to me, what happens this year 
and how fast your team will support and, and, and communicate with the cruise lines. And uh, sometimes they, they ask me, you know, uh, when will the cruise lines be back? And I say to them, listen, not only you, but also your neighbors in the itinerary should get your act together. You should formulate your plans and communicate this with the cruise lines and they will come. And they will come. It's like giving, uh, and excuse my phrase, a sweet to a, a small child, right? If you prepare the sweet, the, the child will come. And okay, uh, the metaphor is there, but uh, at the moment, the, the cruise lines are doing their part. And that we know. There's very strict rules, especially in the US, also here in Europe, and all the cruise lines are doing their part on preparing the ships and the situation. You know, having the labs in the ships, uh, doing drills, uh, you know, doing the whole lot. Uh, destinations and ports should do the same. Uh, my company um, uh, has formed uh, an assessment and that's the, something new. I will come out in the next uh, month where I go in before the pre start and do an assessment, a very thorough assessment, and check all the um, all those thoughtful protocols and independently, you know, um, um, calculate if they've done everything correct or what improvements they can still do. And that, that thing I can, it can be a great tool uh, for ports around the world to uh, validate uh, in all the efforts. But so I'm here. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, the cruise family is strong, um, Claudine, and uh, that uh, even though 21 would be an adjustment year, I sincerely hope that 2022, with all the new ships coming out, uh, and definitely from 23, uh, you know, the tourist community will thrive again. People are, are eager to travel. They've got money to spend because we've been saving, you know, in this past year, obviously. And I hope uh, that cruise can be uh, a good choice for everybody. You know, uh, I have enjoyed cruises many times as all of us. So I urge people to, you know, I think it's the safest, actually, to me, the safest means of doing holidays at the moment or vacations. Thank you, Jonas. I love it. And you're doing a great job. You've been working with a lot of ports and you worked with uh, the port of Maine close to me not long ago. So congratulations. Okay, one last question before we finish. I want to ask you, who is one of your favorite mentors or someone you really look up to? I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with you, Giannis. Well, uh, listen, I had uh, this professor in, in university, in college, right? And uh, I, I, I will never, never forget his words in our first, first lecture, right? Uh, he, he was a famous Professor Morris, right? God bless where he is now. Um, and uh, the guy walks in, uh, very famous project manager in the UK at the time. We're talking now 96, right? 1996. And he goes in, comes in and says, look, I will tell you this and I'll go. I don't want you to do anything else but think this uh, and think it every day. If you don't ask, you don't get. If you don't get, you lose nothing. And this is something which uh, I follow all the time, uh, especially in this industry. You should ask questions. You should ask for people's help. You should ask the cruise lines, you know, to, to get you uh, into uh, their, their itineraries. Uh, I mean, if they say no, the only thing you can do is improve and go back. That's simple. Great answer. I love it. Let's see. Brian, you're next. Favorite mentor. Uh, I, I had a name pop into my head right away, and I, I've told her this before, so I hope she gets to see this video because I will I'll repeat what I've said in the past. Um, Marianne Eisinger, um, she was a Ford Operations Manager for Holland America for, for 20 plus years, um, has been a, a rock for me at times in, in my career of being able to bounce ideas off of, um, take leadership from uh, you know, with 20 plus years in port operations, she is a, an encyclopedia of, of ports and knowledge and, and, and operations. And so uh, when I was transitioning into this role and, and, and leaving Holland America Group and coming over to Royal, I was able to confide in her and, and share my worries and my concerns and my excitement about moving into this role. And uh, she was able to guide me and, and give me um, a lot of confidence in what I was able to do and what I would be able to do in the future. Um, she retired at probably the best time someone could ever retire. She, she retired from the industry uh, months before COVID came and is 
back in Vancouver and, and relaxing and loving life. And um, I think the one thing that she had said to me when she had retired, her phone wasn't ringing as much. She was very disturbed that her phone wasn't <laughs> ringing as much. Um, she was running at 100, 150 miles an hour at all times. And then she hit the brakes, retired and uh, well deserved. Um, as day we chat and call back home and um, she does supply me with my Tim Hortons coffee via mail. So I, I, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but yeah, she was the first name that popped into my head as, as a mentor and um, just a great person. And if you haven't had the privilege of meeting her in the past, maybe you will in, in the future when we get back to Sea Trade because she may be retired, but she's not out of the industry. That's so nice. Thank you for sharing, Brian. And I look forward to meeting her one day. David, your turn. Well, I would just echo just to say, uh, Marion is great. I, I had the chance to work with her over the years and, and uh, certainly wish her well and continued uh, retirement there. Uh, I would answer kind of two ways. One, like Giannis, I had a professor uh, at, uh, in college that really guided me because uh, I had a mindset growing up early that I want to do business for one reason or the other. I really didn't understand what that meant, but I just was fascinated by the business world. And so when I got to college, I started taking the economics class. And after the first test, I didn't perform very well at all. And then I started to think, well, have I made the wrong choice? I have friends that are going to pre-med, other ones studying biology or doing professorships or so forth. And so I went to go meet with the professor and I said, look, all my life I've envisioned going into the business world and this economics, you know, through eventual business school is kind of the path I've always seen. And I said, I'm freaking out a little bit here. Um, and he was able kind of just to work with me and, and kind of take a step back and allow me really to develop into to the economics student um, that he saw potential in, and uh, which was great. So I took every economics course available there. And uh, at the end of my sophomore year, he created the Economics Excellence Award and, and gave that to me. So it was really Kind of saying that, you know, at times you need reinforcement and, and you need someone along the way, whether that's parent or professors and so forth, you know, to give you that confidence. Uh, and that's what I needed, you know, to get me through college uh, from that perspective. And I would say within the industry, I've learned the most, uh, you know, still from my boss, Gior. So Gior Israel has been uh, an incredible mentor. And, and like Brian said, in terms of an encyclopedia, he wrote a dictionary on cruising. Uh, and, and I still learn from him, you know, every day and, and it's been great to collaborate with him and bounce off ideas. So uh, I say it's really a partnership with him because I've started with him and have been, you know, in that same group and, and with him all these years. I've, I've never changed, uh, you know, any other department or teams uh, in my time at Carnival or within the industry. So I think I've really been blessed in that in that manner. That's beautiful. Thank you, David. And thank you to all of you for being here and for sharing your knowledge with us. Have an awesome day. Take care. Bye. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great day. Take care.